from inside a brand new location. Inside the warehouse at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, it is the Masson All Access Podcast. For those of you who are tuning in on Facebook and on YouTube, you are getting a look at a brand new Masson All Access Podcast set. Wow. And it is gorgeous, if I do say so myself. We put it together mostly ourselves, so we are biased. Right. However, Brendan, we've got a still a brick, you know, kind of background. We are probably going to be working through some some kinks today, yeah. Uh, because you know we're we're trying this new set out, but I like it so far. Yeah, it, it, I think it looks pretty good. My favorite addition to the set is the Oreo Bird toothbrush holder, which we have added, which I think looks great. Now I think we just need an Oreo's toothbrush. Where we are you going to get an, an Oreo's toothbrush? Where are you going to get an Oreo's toothbrush? You want to be brushing your teeth with like Trey Mancini's fairy? picture on there? I don't know. Tooth Fairy? That's not what the Tooth the Fairy's Orioles job. Tooth Fairy? I not their job. Well, okay. Maybe it should it's be. It's to take the teeth. Right. Not to provide. They take the teeth and then give you. Maybe you could use an that Orioles money toothbrush. to pay for an Orioles toothbrush. Yeah. We're coming up with new giveaways we, for the Orioles marketing team. You know, start <laughs> writing this stuff down because this is, uh, this is, this gold is genius right here. stuff. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in today. Uh, we have so much to discuss. It has been over a week since our last podcast, and it is just a week until opening day. So, Brendan, we have so much to discuss because the roster has been in flux as the Orioles trim down their original gigantic spring training roster, which included all their spring training invitees. They're trying to get it down to an opening day 28-man roster. And even though that number is bigger than it has been in previous years, they started with 30, I believe, in 2020. But 28 is still two more than the 26 that they had in 2021. Even with that large number, it's getting difficult to squeeze all these guys in and to, to make sure that we're not leaving anybody out because it has been an absolutely jam-packed and condensed spring training camp here. Yeah, it was nice to see kind of the prospects that we knew weren't going to make the team in spring training. It was fun to see those guys play, like Jordan Westberg, Kyle Stowers, guys we knew that weren't going to crack the opening day roster. It was fun to see them in spring training, but now, like you said, Paul, we are down to crunch time, and it feels like it's not as easy as we might have thought it would be to crunch the roster down to 28. It kind of seems like there are 30, 31 players that could realistically make the 28-man opening day roster. Yeah, we're going to give our predictions by the end of today's show as to who those 28 guys will be. But in the meantime, Brendan, you mentioned the guys that we pretty much figured were not going to make the roster. And Obviously, we know, you know, Adley Rutschman, considering his injury, was not going to make the roster, unfortunately. D.L. Hall was a long shot, considering he barely pitched in double-A last year. And then Kyle Bradish, we thought, coming into the spring training, that he was not going to make this roster. There was just no way. He wasn't outstanding in triple-A last year, even though he got the bulk of the season there. But he looked so good in the small sample size that we got of him that the media and third-party like us, started to look at that and say, maybe he's on his way to cracking a rotation spot because there are so few viable options there. However, he was optioned down to AAA Norfolk uh, and the Orioles optioned D.L. Hall down to AA Bowie, but essentially he's going to start the season in Sarasota working his way back up. But Brendan, both of those guys, I think fans are obviously eager to see at some point soon, but both those guys... We'll need a little bit more work in the minors before they get called up. Yeah, Kyle Bradish especially, it just kind of seems like Mike Elias was always going to stick to the blueprint. Not to say that Kyle Bradish didn't have any chance of making the opening day roster because I think there was still an outside chance that he would have, but it was kind of funny when we started our preparation for this podcast, I actually said to you, Paul, that oh, I think Kyle Bradish, given how he's looked so far, is going to make this opening day rotation because he looked like one of the five best starting pitchers at Orioles camp. But I I don't want to say regardless of what Kyle Bradish did, he wouldn't have made the opening day roster. But I think the plan all along was that Kyle Bradish needs to show improvement at AAA Norfolk because, yes, he was fantastic in spring training so far, but let's not forget that Kyle Bradish did not look great at AAA Norfolk last year. Yeah, and I think there are a few ways to interpret Mike Elias' comments about 
optioning both DL Hall and Kyle Bradish, and we're actually going to play a clip of that right now because it's I you can read it a few different ways. So let's take a listen to Mike Elias talking uh, earlier in the week about optioning both DL Hall and Kyle Bradish down to the minor leagues. For those uh, pitchers in particular, both of whom we saw today, and both, both of whom uh, pitched great, um, and we saw the talent on display, um, our main concern is um, building them up for what we expect will uh, be a long season, much of which will be at the major league level. Um, both those guys were impacted by the lockout being on the 40-man roster, now in major league camp for the very first time, having a very rushed camp. We view both of them as starting pitchers. We want them to throw over 100-plus innings this year and um, feel the prep will be uh, better made uh, in minor league camp and hope to have both those guys up and impacting uh, the major league team as soon as possible, but more importantly, as long as possible and without going back down to the minor leagues. So we were very impressed with the work that uh, Bradish in particular did in his two starts. And then, you know, we saw DL's talent on display today and um, the fact that he's healthy, which is huge. And I know he's very excited about the, the season ahead. So the Orioles being conservative, I think you could say with both those guys and listening to those comments, Brendan, him saying, you know, it's going to be a long season for both those guys, much of which will be spent at the major league level. And he wants to get a hundred plus innings from both those guys this year. And he hopes to have them impacting the major league team as soon as possible, but more importantly, as long as possible. Given those comments, when do you think both Kyle Bradish and DL Hall will be making their big league debuts? I think we'll probably see Kyle Bradish pretty quickly. Because Kyle Bradish is 25 years old already. He's going to be turning 26 this year. So I don't think you're all that concerned with the service time with Bradish. I think that's just really when he's ready. We know that Mike Elias has been known to try to, you know, mess with it a little bit. And, and maybe the prospects are ready to go before they're actually called up because that's more of a service time issue. But with Kyle Bradish, I don't think you're really concerned with that. So I think we could see him as early as may how because, how early in may that's my question I, I it's it's kind of splitting hairs here right but i think it depends on how we're going to get to the 28 man roster in a bit but i think it depends on how the starters at the back end of that rotation look if dean kramer or keegan aiken or zach lowther performs really well and proves that they should be a part of that starting rotation then there's no need to rush kyle bradish but if one of those guys Luke's out pretty quickly after four or five starts, then maybe it's time to look at Bradish. Well, and I think it's interesting that he's lumping together Bradish and Hall because in my mind, and I'm sure in the Orioles' minds, at least I thought so, that Hall was slightly behind Bradish because Hall did not get up to AAA last year. Bradish did very early in the season after he dominated in AA Bowie, and Hall missed so much time with injury that I figured that he was going to get called up fairly quickly. So... Or, uh, you know, missed so much time that I think that he was going to be slowed down, rather, right. compared to Bradish. So it's interesting that they're looping them together, but I think Bradish will definitely, deb- uh, barring injury, will definitely debut first. I just wonder how wide the gap is also between Hall and Bradish. You know, is Bradish going to get called up in mid May and then we have to wait until July for Hall? But, you know, give, given these comments, the fact that Elias was pretty bullish on both these guys coming up soon leads me to believe that they're, you know, Hall is not too many steps far behind in terms of development and readiness than Bradish is. Well, look, if D.L. Hall doesn't get hurt last year, I think there's a non-zero chance that D.L. Hall makes his major league debut in 2021. Right. Because D.L. Hall was on that progression. We know the talent is there. The stuff is incredible that we saw the other day. So D.L. Hall is a little bit behind, but I think him being a little bit behind kind of puts him where Bradish was because talent-wise, D.L. Hall is pretty close to the majors at this point. So D.L. Hall was set back by those injuries, but I don't think he was set back so far that he's not going to debut this year. Right. So, like you said, it's not like they had no chance whatsoever, I guess, to make the opening day roster, but the chances were slim to begin with. And I think... If He's sticking to the blueprint. And if you're if you're going into camp with that mindset, I know there's some disappointment of them, especially Bradish, not making the opening day roster. I get that. But from... If you go into 
the with the mindset that neither of them were going to make it anyway, then you can look at the positives and say, look, they both look very good in a small amount of time. D.L. Hall was pumping 100 miles an hour, which, you know, it's exciting, but he still has the same issues. He still had command issues in the small appearances that we saw him in spring training, and until those issues get hammered out, it's going to be difficult to say that he is big league ready. And I think it's important to keep in mind, too, that, like, yes, you can be disappointed that they didn't make the opening day roster, but that's not to say that any of their results in spring training aren't going towards making a case for them to be called up sooner next year. I right. mean, Kyle Bradish, maybe his track was just advanced where if he didn't have such a good spring training, maybe we see him in July. Right now, because the spring training was so impressive and you're combining that information with maybe some success at AAA Norfolk, that moves his timeline up. Yeah. Maybe now he's debuting in May instead of July. And the same thing can be said for D.L. Hall. He looks good in spring training, and that goes into your evaluation process when you're looking at how he performs in the minor leagues at the beginning of the year. The other name that the Orioles option, in addition to Alexander Wells, who was slightly surprising, but you know we he would, did not look like he was cutting it against big league hitters in spring training, so he's out of the conversation. But Yusni Aldias is the more intriguing name there because similar to Bradish, Came into camp with, I think, very little expectations that he was going to make the opening day roster considering he hit in the 160s in AAA Norfolk last year. This guy really cannot get lucky in terms of health. He has struggled with every injury under the sun. But he looked great in spring training, and it feels like every single year, Yusniel Diaz dominates in spring training because he has incredible tools. He looks great physically. He's fully healthy now, and you thought maybe he could sneak his way onto this opening day roster. But again, Michael Elias following the same blueprint, and especially with a guy like Diaz, who really, the last time we saw him playing in games, he didn't look good. He was not cutting it production-wise. And so they have to see that he is going to be ready. I mean, you can say what you want, and it's great to see that a guy is going to be good in a shortened spring training sample size, but that is not what you're going to see in a major league season. It's probably not even what you're going to see in a triple-A season. So you just have to see it actually play out in front of you in terms of a, a minor league season before you can call him up. He has to have success at Norfolk before he can get to Baltimore. Right, and Yusniel Diaz is not a 157 at Triple A type of hitter. Michael Elias has talked about it at length. He has said that he pretty much counts Yusniel Diaz's 2021 as a lost season because he was dealing with so many injuries that you can't really look at the numbers because Michael Elias is just assuming as, you know, Fans who are hopeful are assuming that that poor production was just due to the injuries and that that is not the actual use Neil Diaz that we would see once he is healthy at AAA Norfolk and hopefully healthy at the major league level. But you need to actually see it. Yeah, you can be hopeful that the poor production can all be accounted for because of his injury luck. Right. But you need to see him healthy at AAA Norfolk before you can justify calling him up to the majors. And I think an important point too, would you rather see a healthy use Neil Diaz starting every day at AAA Norfolk, or would you rather have him be the fifth outfielder in Baltimore, not getting that much playing time right. and not really developing at the rate that he would if he was getting every day time. Right. I'd rather see him at AAA. And the question becomes, and we're going to get in, like I said, we're going to get into our prediction, but who are you having ahead of him? And when you're talking about Ryan McKenna, look, Ryan McKenna has earned a spot ahead of Yusniel Diaz. Absolutely. If he's your fourth outfielder, he's obviously, you know, you're not going to play Yusniel Diaz over Hayes, uh, Mountcastle, or sorry, excuse me, Hayes, Mullins, or Santander. And if McKenna, you go with four outfielders, McKenna has is, is better right now. He's shown that he can hit at AAA before he got to the big leagues. He mashed AAA. He sh yeah. yeah, in the small sample size we got of him last year in AAA, and then to have made some improvements this spring. So, and obviously he's better defensively than some of these guys. Right. So, or than use Neil Diaz. So in my mind, McKenna has earned a spot ahead of him. The question becomes, if you go with five outfielders, DJ Stewart, because DJ Stewart, if he is your fifth outfielder, is not long for this roster in my mind and, and has not shown that he deserves any more of an opportunity than use Neil Diaz. However, we do still need to see Yusniel Diaz be productive at AAA, and getting him to that spot, I think, is what's important for, for Michael Elias. Right. DJ Stewart, 
I, again, we'll get into it when we look at the outfield in our 28-man roster predictions, but the leash is going to be short because yeah. in very short order, you if, are going to have... If he makes it. Right, if he makes the team at all. Because in very short order, you are going to have Kyle Stowers, Yusniel Diaz, Robert Newstrom, Tyler Nevin. All of those guys have a legitimate case to make the team at some point in the near future over DJ Stewart. So Kyle Stowers is still in big league camp as of this recording. He was optioned yesterday. Or he was optioned yesterday. Yes. So he was optioned days after, or one or two days after, Yusniel Diaz. Does that mean Kyle Stowers is ahead of Yusniel Diaz? Does that mean he's going to get called up before Yusniel Diaz? I think if Kyle Stowers performs like he did last year at AAA Norfolk and is outperforming Yusniel Diaz, there's no reason for him not to be ahead of Diaz. Right. I think that's a fair question to ask. Yeah. And then where does Tyler Nevin fit into all this? Because if he doesn't make, and he's not in either of our 28-man opening day roster predictions... Where is his opportunity going to come from unless think, an injury affects one of the top four guys? Right. I think it's an injury or I think Nevin falls under a similar category of Robert Newstrom where the production at AAA Norfolk has to be exceptional to yeah. jump Kyle Stowers or use Neil Diaz because the tools aren't there for Nevin. The tools aren't there for Newstrom like they are for Stowers and Diaz. So the production has to be a lot better to justify it. It does, but... It'll be a good problem to have, but right. I think the Orioles potentially face an issue in a few weeks or a few months of Robert Newstrom, Tyler Nevin, Kyle Stowers, using the ideas. All these guys are doing really well in Norfolk. How do we fit these guys on the roster? Great problem. It's a great problem to have, but I would love, and I, I'm sure that the Orioles will make sure that they give an opportunity where it is deserved, right. where these guys are hitting well and where they're playing well. And then that gets into a scenario of maybe trading an Anthony Santander, moving some guys around. Again, moves can, good problems. Moves can also still be made in the final week. Mike Elias has kind of thrown a little bit of cold water on that. He does like to make moves up until the deadline, so to speak, up until the deadline when they have to set their their 28-man opening day roster. I, I look at last year with Adam Plutko being a, a last-minute addition. But it seems like the Orioles will tend to be in the acquisition mode, especially pitching. That's where I think if they're going to make a move over the next week, that's probably where it's going to be. However, a team could get desperate for outfield help and come calling with offers for Anthony Santander, and maybe that's a move that Michael Elias is willing to make. Right. But keep in mind, Anthony Santander, still only 27. He's not much older than these guys in this conversation. You know, the Tyler Nevins, the Robert Newstroms, they're between the, using the ideas, between the ages of 24 and 26. So keep that in mind when, when discussing an Anthony Santander potential trade. Right. Um, all right, let's get into who we think will be on this opening day roster because in our minds, there are 14 locks, in my mind, at least. I've got 12. 12 locks? Yes. Okay. Well, we'll get into it. I'm going to give my 14 locks. You stop me when this guy is not in here. Okay. Okay. John Means. Roster uh, lock? Yeah. Tough question. Yeah. Your opening day starter. Jordan Lyles. Also a roster lock. Yep. Ryan Mountcastle. Yep. Trey Mancini. Yeah. These <laughs> you, are, you can roll through these. Also, yeah. all beginning uh, with, the, you know, the caveat that injury could change things because the Orioles would could put a guy on the 10-day IL and add somebody else for their 28-man roster. So they've been remarkably, knock on wood, healthy throughout camp. Yeah. Typically, one or two guys goes down with injuries, and then we're talking about you know guys filling in. But yeah, That's good. Knocking on wood. You knocked on wood there. Good job. See, this is what you're missing if you're not watching the, the live stream on Facebook and YouTube. You're just listening to it. Yeah. All right, so we have Means, Lyles, Mountcastle, Mancini, Mullins, Hayes, Santander, barring a trade. I have Tanner Scott in my bullpen. I think yep. he's a lock. Cole Sulcer, he was so good last year in the bullpen. Tyler Wells, whether he's a starter or a reliever, lock he's a lock. Way. Ramon Rios, yep. got to give him another opportunity. Jorge Lopez, pretty close to a lock in my mind. Is he one of your So 12? he falls into, I have a separate category of like 90 percenters. Okay. Jorge Lopez falls into the 90 percenters. Okay. So he's not one of your 12 locks, however. He's not an absolute lock, but he is a... Pretty much you can call him a lock if you feel like it. Okay. I think considering that the Orioles were willing to skip arbitration, you know, with him and give him a deal that was about a million dollars, I think. I agree. And, and, you know, how good he looked in the small sample size we got of him in the bullpen last year. I, I, think, I completely agree. He's just not a surefire no, I, 100% Which is fair lock. because 
the you know the role for him will be a little bit muddier than it was last year. And if they give up on him as a starter entirely, well, then he's got to make the bullpen. You know, because right. if he if he cannot bounce back and forth legitimately between the rotation and the bullpen, he's not quite as valuable as he was last year. Robinson Chirinos, going to yep. be your opening day catcher. He's a lock as well. And Dylan Tate is my last lock. Yeah, Dylan Tate, 90 percenter again. Okay. Dylan Tate, to me, 27 years old, not outstanding, not a great strikeout rate, induces weak contact, but I think there's a role for him in this bullpen. So to me, I think Dylan Tate makes it. I agree. Again, it, these are all guys that I think make the team. Okay. They're just not, can't call them 100% locks because if a Dylan Tate or a Jorge Lopez didn't make the team it would be very surprising but yeah. it's not like you just cut Cedric Mullins right so the almost locks the 90 percenters if you will yes. and this is I didn't put this at 90 percent but these guys I think are pretty much locks yeah Bruce Zimmerman yeah I think <laughs> so but if you read Rockabaco's morning post mm -hmm. we'll get into Dean Kramer in a little bit but Dean Kramer seems to be I think Rock said the the lead dog in terms of uh, being the number three behind uh, John Means and Jordan Lyles yes. in the rotation. And the final two spots might be up to, well, the final spot, if Tyler Wells is a starter, mm -hmm. might be between Bruce Zimmerman and Zach Lowther. To me, Zimmerman has to get an opp another opportunity. And whether that's as a piggyback starter, which we could see the Orioles employ this year, especially to start the year as these guys are not ready to you know, go seven innings every five days, or as a starter, because I think that he needs another opportunity. Now, if he takes that opportunity and he does not perform, then I think that's another conversation. But in my mind, I think he should get another opportunity, considering he was, he was fine as a yep. starter last year. And I think Bruce Zimmerman is a good one to put in that almost lock, because mm -hmm. even if he doesn't make the rotation... I think Bruce Zimmerman is almost a lock to be a long reliever. Yeah. At the very least. Rugnet Odor. Yeah. Another one, 90 percenter, because if he's not a starter, he doesn't really have a role. But so I think he's probably your starter at second base. And this is where we miss out on some things. And this is why it's always great to to read Rock's coverage when he's down in Sarasota, because he is getting all this inside information. Right. We looked at this as saying Rugnet Odor is going to be in this opening day roster, he's going to be their starting second baseman. And we didn't think twice about it until we read Rock's article from a couple days ago saying he's not 100%. And the fact that he does not feel comfortable playing at third could give the Orioles pause because they want as much versatility in this infield as possible. Especially when you have Ramon Arias, mm -hmm. who has had a great spring. Chris Owings, who has had a great spring. Both of those guys can play second or third. And if you are trying to trim the roster somewhere, you would probably start with Rugnet Odor, who does not have the ability, or at least from his own words. He said he was uncomfortable yes. playing third base. Yep. He played third base for the Yankees last year. I've said on this podcast before that I thought he was a possibility to be the starter at the hot corner. But if Rugnet Odor is not comfortable playing third, second base is a tough position to have that be your sole position if you are not providing a ton of value there it is but he's still one of the more proven big leaguers on this roster yes. and especially in this infield because as good as Ramon Rios looked last year he's barely played in the big leagues you know Kelvin Gutierrez is still on the fringes of the major leagues and quad a so to speak so he still has multiple 30 home run seasons in his career. He still has a proven track record. And to me, that's worth a roster spot. And it's worth giving him a shot at second base on opening day and for the first couple months of the season. Now, if, again, if he does not do well in the first couple months of the season, you can cut him and that's no harm, no foul. But when we talk about comparisons with Yolmer Sanchez, Orioles claimed him last offseason. He went through all of their... 40-man roster additions in their Rule 5 draft, and they kept him around, and we got up until, right up until opening day, the end of spring training, and the Orioles cut him. And that was a big shock to us because we had penciled him in as our opening day second baseman, similar to how we're doing with Rudin at Odor. Could we be looking at a similar situation here? I don't think so because the major difference is that they signed Rudin at Odor to a major league deal worth right. about a million dollars. A waiver claim 
is very different. You have very little attachment to those guys. Brian Baker, CNL Perez, those guys are waiver claims. Those guys aren't guaranteed a certain amount of money, whether you have them on the roster or not. Rugnet Odor is a different case. Yeah, in terms of the Odor comparison there, he's younger than Yolmer Sanchez, Mm -hmm. and he has been a more proven major league player than Yolmer Sanchez ever was. Rugnet Odor has not been at his peak for a few years, like he was in Texas, but if Rugnet Odor can somehow get back to that peak, that is still something that you at least need to explore if you're... If you're the order. So yeah. I think Rugnit Odor is about a 90% chance to make the roster. I do too. All right. Paul Fry. I think he makes it. I think he makes it too. I don't know if he's 100%, but he's 90%. 90%. Uh, Jorge Mateo. I would put him closer to a lock than okay. some of the other guys, but Jorge Mateo, 90%. Closer to a lock than Kelvin Gutierrez or no? Yes. Interesting. I, I think he's a better player than Kelvin Gutierrez, and he provides you more positional value at shortstop at shortstop than Kelvin Gutierrez does. which I mean if you're if you're not keeping Jorge Mateo you're looking at a Chris Owings opening day shortstop right or Ramon Arias which is fine but and if you were to cut Kelvin Gutierrez you're looking at a Ramon Arias opening day third baseman or a Chris Owings opening day third yeah. baseman which I think you're fine with right so Kelvin Gutierrez also fits into my almost lock yes. category as well so that's and Chris Owings as well, 30 years old, too valuable defensively, at least versatility-wise. And he's looked great this spring. He has. I think he absolutely makes this team. Yep. Uh, all right, so that gives me 14 locks. I have another almost lock. Do you? I do. Hold on. 14 locks and almost and six almost locks for me, so I have eight open spots on my roster that I'm going to fill. But I want to hear, you had 12 locks. Who are your? Who's the one guy that I did not discuss as an almost lock? Ryan McKenna. I think he's an almost lock to make the team because realistically, Mm -hmm. you already know that Kyle Stowers and Yusniel Diaz are not making the team. Yep. The only player that would be your fourth outfielder rather than Ryan McKenna, realistically at this point, Mm -hmm. is DJ Stewart. Right. I would give Ryan McKenna a pretty wide margin between him and DJ Stewart in terms of their value and who's making the team because Ryan McKenna, at least defensively, You can argue that DJ Stewart's offensive numbers have the chance to be better this year than Ryan McKenna's, but DJ Stewart is only going to be your right fielder, and defensively, he's going to be a subpar defensive right fielder. Yeah. Ryan McKenna is a pretty good defensive center fielder and a very good corner outfielder defensively in left or right. And think about how that will affect the Orioles at Oriole Park at Camden Yards this year. Exactly. Because you have a brand new left field that's going to be a challenge, regardless of how good your defender is there. It's a new area of the ballpark and it's going to be manned by somebody. It should be manned by somebody who knows what they're doing there, or at least can adjust and has the speed to make up for it. So for me, because of his defense, I think Ryan McKenna is a 90% chance to make the team. I think he's close and I I have him as in the mix in my group. So I I think he is awfully close and, and to me, he should be their fourth outfielder. Let's talk about the guys who were in the mix. So that that would give you what twenty guys, or twelve I guys and nineteen. Nineteen. Okay, I think nineteen. So then we're filling up the other eight or nine spots on this roster. The backup catcher job is an interesting one. The Orioles like all three guys that they have in, in camp right now: Anthony Benboom, Jacob Nottingham, and Bo Taylor. Jacob Nottingham to me should have the edge because he is a little bit younger than those guys and has hit just as well as those guys, if not better, in camp. And I think that's worth an opportunity. The Orioles don't have really anything invested in these guys. They're All three of these guys were signed to minor league deals, so it's not like they have preference. They've shown their preference for any one of these guys. I think it's going to come down to, do the Orioles want to take Jacob Nottingham, who is bats from the same side of the plate as Robinson Chirinos, or do they want to mix it up and have a left-handed and a right-handed hitting catcher? Right, so I went with Ben Boom just because he's left-handed. Yeah, I think Nottingham on the surface makes more sense if you're not looking at the splits because he's younger, he has performed better at the major league level than Anthony Benboom has, and you can realistically see Jacob Nottingham maybe growing into a quality backup catcher at some point in his career. Whereas Anthony Benboom, you kind of know what you have. He's an older veteran presence, but he's left-handed. And I think... 
because you are going to be working with a Chirinos kind of platoon option until Adley Rutschman gets up to the major leagues. Chirinos, throughout the last few years, has been really successful in a platoon situation. His splits are great against left-handed pitching. So because you consistently want to get Chirinos in against left-handed starters, I think Bembu might make sense because if you want to give Chirinos an off day, it would make the most sense to give Chirinos an off day against a right-handed starting pitcher, and that's where having a left-handed backup catcher might be more valuable than seeing what you have in Nottingham. So that's why I go with Ben Boom. And the question is, how long is that backup catcher going to get an opportunity before Adley Rutschman gets called up? Are we right. talking weeks? Are we talking months? And then Chirinos becomes the backup catcher. And then Chirinos becomes an ideal backup. I mean, then, you're, then your catching situation looks like one of the better catching situations in the American League very right. quickly. Because Chirinos is a very good backup catcher right. at the major league level. So for me, in my 28-man roster, I went with... Uh, Nottingham simply because I, I agree with those points. I think they're fair. I think it's a toss up. I right. think at the Orioles minds, it's not a huge, it's also not a make or break decision because Adley Rushman will come up and spell one of these guys. And we're not going to be talking about this by September. We're not going to be looking back and saying, Oh Hopefully. man, the Orioles really missed an opportunity by going with them boom instead of Nottingham or vice versa. Right. Uh, yeah, but hopefully not. We're going to be doing wood. a lot of knocking on wood in this new podcast. I think you can so. just, just because it's here. Right. I think you can just say it, and in, you don't have to physically knock it's on the wood. It's an easy, it's an easy knock. Whatever. Okay. Uh, <laughs> other guys that are in the mix here, Brendan. Yeah. Pitchers are going to be the big question. Yes. Which relievers are going to be in this, in this bullpen is the biggest question here. Yeah. And I think you could talk about a Travis Likens. Isaac Matson, unfortunately, is out of the conversation because he's dealt with injuries and he's ramping back up. Chris Ellis has been signed to a minor league deal after he looked good as a starter last year, but could he make sense as a reliever this year? Brian Baker, CNL Perez, both those guys waiver claims. Keegan Aiken, if he's not in the rotation, where are you putting him? And then the question of Lowther, Zimmerman, Kramer. If those guys don't make the rotation, or if one or two of those guys don't make the rotation, can they squeeze into the bullpen as a piggyback guy or as a long reliever? Yeah, so I think the bullpen conversation, if it's okay with you, I think it needs to start with the starting pitcher conversation. That's okay with me. I'll give you my permission. Yeah. The starting pitcher conversation, I think, is really going to dictate who is in the bullpen. Yeah. So, from what we've seen so far, we know John Means and Jordan Lyles are going to be the two starting pitchers at the top. Mm -hmm. They were in our locks. Tyler Wells was also in our locks. Yep. And according to Rakabako, it seems like the Orioles are determined to make Tyler Wells a starter. Yep. So they are at least going to try it. Yeah. We've been talking for weeks here about the starting rotation, saying who takes up the three spots after John Means and Jordan Lyles. Now it's a conversation of two because Tyler Wells is going to take one of those five spots. That's what it seems like. Right. From from our perspective. And it's interesting because all offseason, we didn't factor him into the equation because when the Orioles were given the opportunity in 2021 to use him as a starter, remember when he's missed significant time with injury and then he came back? Yeah. They had a chance to use him as a starter and maybe replace a Jorge Lopez, and they chose not to. Maybe that's just because the Orioles didn't want to stretch him out in the middle of his rookie season and throw too much at him and also maybe screw up his arm. Now they're trying it in a shortened spring training. Yeah. They're trying to squeeze in this workload. It's interesting. It's a, it's a, certainly a strategy here. I'm not against it. I think Wells has the opportunity to be a good starter. I said it on last podcast. I think the Orioles probably know better than we do in terms of where his arm is at. And if it's not as a six-inning, seven-inning starter, if it's as a piggyback guy, if it's as a start the game and get us to the fourth or fifth inning, we'll have Chris Ellis, we'll have... Keegan Aiken come in and spell you, then I certainly like that a little bit more than asking him to go out and and be a work workhorse starter. You right. Know? It, it was kind of a storyline that for a few weeks we've kind of just gone ah, there's no way they're going to do that. Right. And it, then it, they they did. It was not on the. It, it was always possible, but it was it was less likely than one of these other guys filling in. Right. Who are who is a starter? I but mean, at this point, Aiken, Kramer, Zimmerman, these guys are louder. These guys are starters. Even Wells. Right. So at this point, I think we have to assume that Alexander three rotation Wells, spots. Wells, sorry, yeah, three rotation spots are locked at this point. If we are assuming, from what we've been hearing, that Tyler Wells is going to be a starter, 
So those three are done. Dean Kramer, apparently, again, according to Rockabaco's post this morning, has heard that Dean Kramer, after the top two guys, is in the lead for yeah. a rotation spot. They liked how he pitched against the Phillies. No, he gave up two home runs, but I think the two home runs were to Castellanos and Schwarber. Yeah. So you gave Who, up. I think he str- he struck out Schwarber as well. He right. struck out Harper. He, so, had, he gave up a lot of home runs and struck out a lot of guys. <laughs> right. So you gave up two home runs to two of the better power hitters in all of Major League Baseball. You didn't give up two home runs at the back end of the Phillies game when you're facing double A minor leaguers right. at that point. So Dean Kramer, yes, the results in terms of the runs he has given up have not been great in spring training, but the Orioles have liked how he's been pitching. And so I think Dean Kramer makes the rotation. And then the fifth guy that I have is Bruce Zimmerman. Yeah. So that's my rotation. Okay. So you think he beats out Zach Lowther? I think he does. But I think because you have Tyler Wells and you're trying to stretch him a Mm -hmm. little bit, I don't think we're going to see Tyler Wells go seven innings in his first start of the year. So I think it makes sense to have Zach Lowther as a long relief, maybe even a sixth starter. Yeah, I, I think you could use him in one of two ways. You either supplement Tyler Wells, where Wells goes four innings, maybe Zach Lowther can give you three, or you have Zach Lowther as a kind of sixth starter in yeah. a rotation. So let's just get into your 28-man roster, because you just hinted at it pretty strongly. I did. I did. Do you want to talk about your, your 28-man sure. roster and who makes your bullpen? And yeah, who does so not? my starting rotation, like I said, John Means, Jordan Lyles, mm-hmm. Tyler Wells, Dean Kramer, Bruce Zimmerman. Mm-hmm. Those are my starting five. The bullpen gets interesting because I think Zach Lowther makes the bullpen in some way, shape, or form. And then I've got Tanner Scott, Cole Sulser, Jorge Lopez, Paul Fry, Brian Baker, I think makes the bullpen. Felix Bautista, I've been on for a while. I've had that take. I'm sticking to it. You got to stick with that take that he was going to make stick the opening with the take day there. Felix Bautista makes my bullpen. Look, he can throw 100. He's intriguing. Yeah. But he's intriguing. He's fun. He looked good he, yesterday. Can he keep his walks down? Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Felix Bautista, Dylan Tate, Cianol Perez, mm-hmm. I think makes the bullpen as a good lefty. And then Keegan Aiken, I think, sneaks into the bullpen. I think the days of Keegan Aiken, the starter, are behind us. I think he is a long reliever who maybe jumps in and makes a few starts here and there when the Orioles need him. Spot starter. Right. Okay. I've I, got... Oh, I was going to no, keep, keep yeah, rolling keep, with keep, it. Keep going. My two catchers, Robinson, Torinos, and Jacob Nottingham. The seven infielders, this is just kind of chalk the rest of the way. Mountcastle, Mancini, Odor, Arias, Mateo, Gutierrez, Owings. Yeah. And then four outfielders, Cedric Mullins, Austin Hayes, Anthony Santander, Ryan McKenna. So in this scenario, DJ Stewart does not make the opening day roster. Yep. Keep in mind, the Orioles, with their 26-man opening day roster in 2021, went with nine relievers, five starters, four outfielders, six infielders, and two catchers. So essentially, what you're doing is adding an infielder, and you're adding a reliever by going with 10 relievers, seven infielders, as opposed to nine and five. Yeah, so some of the guys I left out, Mike Bauman. Nine and six. Chris Ellis, Alexander Wells, in terms of pitchers. Yeah. Uh, catchers, I left out uh, Jacob Nottingham, Bo Taylor. Infielders, Jemai Jones is already down. Tyler Nevin and Richie Martin, Yep, I left out. And then outfielders, I leave out DJ Stewart. I think Ellis, as of a week ago, I might have penciled in Ellis to make this bullpen at the very least and be a spot starter, but he has not looked very good in spring training so far, and I think he's starting to come back down to earth. Yeah, and we talked about Ellis last week where his advanced numbers were not good. They did not help him. His ERA on the surface was pretty good, but his strikeout-to-walk ratio was terrible. His expected ERA was not good. Yeah. So Chris Ellis, I think, was a benefactor of a small sample size last year my 28 man roster brendan does not differ all too too much from yours however my starting five is different okay i have john means jordan lyles tyler wells dean kramer but i got and bruce simran 
That's that, the same starting five. All right. That does not. Uh, so it's just the exact same <laughs> starting same. five. It's yeah. the same starting five uh, in terms of my like we starting said. five. Like exact we said, same. does not differ that much at all. Yeah. Uh, those five, I think, I give similar to you. I give Zimmerman the edge over Kramer, but I think that that can over change. Over Lowther, you mean? Or over Lowther, excuse me. But I think that that can change. Relievers, I went with nine. So in this Ooh. scenario, I'm leaving out a Felix Bautista, if you will. Okay. But a lot of the same names. Paul Fry, Travis Lakin Sr., Cole Solcer, Dylan Tate. Travis Lakins is a different one as well. That is a different I one. I did not have Travis Lakin Sr. Who did you have instead? I don't remember. Keep <laughs> reading and then I'll tell names. you. This is too many names, Brendan. Uh, Dylan Tate, Tanner Scott, Jorge Lopez. Both had Brian Baker and CNL Perez. Zach Lowther. It was Keegan Aiken. Keegan Aiken who I did not have making yes. this team. So you because have Travis Lakin Sr., I have Keegan Aiken. In my mind, Keegan Aiken is, he, he was just not good enough this spring. For the second straight spring training, he was just not very good. And last year it was 10, in, 10 earned in 10 innings in spring training. This time it's, it's tougher to evaluate because these guys are getting so much smaller sample size and stuff is changing every day. I mean, one guy could have a bad outing and his ERA goes from zero to 15. Right. So it's tougher to evaluate, but I just don't know if the Orioles are willing to give him another opportunity, even in the bullpen. Yeah. So the differences in our bullpen, I have Keegan Aiken and Felix Bautista. Yeah. You have Travis Lakin Sr. Exactly. I went with the same seven infielders, Mancini, Mountcastle, Urias, Odor, Gutierrez, Mateo, Owings. Yep. I think the infield's locked. Yes. The difference, uh, the, uh, two catchers, I have Chirinos, and I went with Nottingham instead of Ben Boom. Yep. And then, big difference here. Now, this isn't what I would do. This is what I think the Orioles will do. And that's go with five outfielders. Yep. And the reason is, I think that DJ Stewart is still in camp, def def despite the fact that he has struggled with injuries, despite the fact that some outfielders are right on the surface of making this team, I have DJ Stewart making this opening day roster. So I have Mullins, Hayes, Santander, McKenna, and DJ Stewart sneaks in for the 28th spot on the 28-man roster. Yeah, I just, like like you said, this is what we think is going to happen and not yeah. what we would do. He just keeps hanging on, Brendan. I know. And we've talked about so many times, I'm not trying to bully DJ Stewart on this podcast, I swear. Don't try it. But we have talked about DJ Stewart not making this team so many times on the podcast that I just couldn't put him on my 28-man roster, especially because I think at this point, given what DJ Stewart has shown you at the Major League level, if you're going to have five outfielders, I'd rather have Tyler Nevin or I'd rather have Robert Newstrom. I'd just rather have those guys on the 28-man roster than DJ Stewart. And again, this is what we think and not what we would do, but if... I personally were to add a fifth outfielder to this team, it would be Tyler Nevin. I also think a lot is made about the opening day roster. We're making a whole entire podcast about this now. <laughs> it's our fault. It's we our are fault making a lot as about well. It. We, we fall under this category as well. But yeah. keep in mind, the opening day roster is not like you're set in stone for a month or even a week. You can change it immediately. Right. Think about guys that have made the opening day roster in previous seasons that we're off the roster within weeks. Rule 5 draft picks. Drew Jackson was sent back sh days after he made his major league debut. Jesus Sucre was their opening day catcher, and he lasted all of 20-some games in 2019. So they can change over time. So while I think DJ Stewart makes this opening day roster, just in my mind, guessing, I think there's a chance that he's off that opening day roster within a week. Yeah, it's a quick leash. Because yeah. as soon as a Kyle Stowers or a Yusniel Diaz is ready, that's your fifth outfielder. And the Orioles might have to do a second trim because they're going to go from 28-man to 26-man, we believe, at some point maybe after the first month of the season because yeah. the 28-man was just because of the shortened spring training and because these teams are getting their pitchers ready. And that gets really interesting because I think at that point you start looking at players who are only playing one position, like a Rugnando Dorr. Yeah. Rather or, than a Chris Owings. Exactly. Or, and this is all going to change, right? You know, maybe in the first couple weeks of the season, Chris Owings is hitting 115 and Rugnet Odor is hitting 300. So that right. equation changes. Or somebody gets injured. It's right. impossible to tell. So the opening day roster, again, is going to look, and especially this season, I think Rock put it very well. Rock's getting a lot of pub on this. Yeah. Pub on this Friend of the pod. Uh, but he put it very well a couple days ago when he said that this season will be unlike 
any season we've seen in the rebuild so far in that we're going to see a lot of rookies and we're going to see a lot of good rookies, not yes. just a lot of rookies filtering up who are getting their cup of coffee in the big leagues. We'll see some of those guys, but we're going to see foundational pieces make their debuts. When Michael Elias said of Bradish and Hall, he wants them to come up for as long as possible. What he meant is these guys, when they come up, congratulations, there's your roster spot for the next X number of years. Yeah, and not months. for every impatient Orioles fan who is looking at our 28-man roster predictions and not seeing some of the top prospects that we've been talking about forever, it seems like, there is a very real possibility that by maybe halfway through the season, it can be an arbitrary time, whatever you want to say, we could see this Orioles roster with core pieces like Cedric Mullins, Austin Hayes, Ryan Mountcastle, who are already here, John Means as well, yep. who are already here, be paired with Adley Rutschman, Kyle Stowers, Yusniel Diaz, Kyle Bradish, D.L. Hall, maybe even Grayson Rodriguez later in the year. This is the year, hopefully, that you are finally going to start seeing it happen. Yeah. They're, they're, like I said, their roster on the last day of the regular season would be vastly different from this roster. And the roster could be awesome could by be the very end of exciting. the year. It could be incredibly exciting. It could be very exciting. Don't know how quickly these guys will make an impact, so to speak. You right. know, expect some rookie struggles. Temper expectations <laughs> yeah. a little bit. But yes. the hope is that by giving these guys a little bit more time in the minor leagues, that they are 100% ready to come up and not be bounced back and forth, not get the be on the shuttle between Norfolk and Baltimore, but be here to stay for months and years. And again, you are exhausting options. Yes. You want to make sure that Dean Kramer doesn't at some point turn into a good starting rotation option. So before you call up Kyle Bradish and take that spot away from Dean Kramer, you need to see what he has. Right. Same case can be made for a Jorge Mateo. When you're looking at Jordan Westberg, Gunnar Henderson, you want to make sure that Jorge Mateo isn't going to all of a sudden turn into a really good shortstop. Yeah. Exhaust that option. Well, speaking of exhaust, this week is going to exhaust us. Yes. As much as we have been exhausted through the first couple of weeks of spring training. I was going to say this week? Yeah. 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 It's Ooh. just all, it's all coming to a head. And I mean, look, the Orioles play a spring training game two days before they play their first regular season game. That's wild. That's a quick turnaround. Yeah. That's a quick turnaround. That's, that's what this you know, shortened spring training has brought. So it's going to be an exciting last week. Guys are going to get cut every day up until the deadline, it feels like. So we could see guys come off the board rather quickly. And the Orioles, similarly, as guys are cut around the league, could be putting in some waiver claims, yeah. potentially. We're going to see how this is all going to go. Stay with us on MassInSports.com and, of course, the Masson app where you get 24-7 coverage. You can also check us out live on YouTube and Facebook. Thanks for tuning in today through our not terrible struggles, but we had some, you know. Yeah, this the, light that kept turning blue. Kept turning blue if you were watching through the whole thing. We, so We look very blue. It got, you know, when we had a somber tone. Maybe we change up some, you know, we hire a spotlighter and we really <laughs> Somebody just standing in the corner with a spotlight. Yeah. You never know. Yeah, Interns. We, this is what, do you want to be a spotlight? Do you want to hold a spotlight for us? <laughs> And exactly. be paid in a crisp high five. Yeah. Well, do we have the job for you? Let us know what you think of our new set. What does it need? Does it need more Trey Mancini as a Jedi bobbleheads? Or uh, toothbrushes. More toothbrushes. Or just a generic. We can just put a generic toothbrush. Doesn't or have a new podcast host. Or what, what is... new host. Replace <laughs> us Yeah. at this point. What does uh, the set need? Yeah. At Brendan Morty is Brendan's Twitter handle. I am at Paul Mancano. Thanks so much for tuning in. We will be back numerous times over the coming week. We're going to have a lot of content coming for you over the next week as we get ready for opening day, which is a week from today around baseball. It is a week from tomorrow for the Orioles as they open on a Friday, and then the Orioles open at home the following Monday against the Brewers. Can't wait for it. I am at Paul Mancano, and Bobby Blanco has been our producer today. Thanks to Bobby. Comment, like, rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff, and we'll catch you next time.